Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to study your word today, to see the ways that we live according to your calling in a depraved and a sinful world. Bless us today as we grow in faith, and bless us also as we apply your truths in a difficult and impure society. In all things, you are good and gracious. Help us to see that, especially with the Sixth Commandment. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today begins kind of a little bit of a change we've been doing. You noticed uh, for our setting, we've been gathering in here, not in there. We've been bringing some younger folks along with us as well. Also, part of our plan for the summer was to involve some of our gentlemen in teaching positions, our council members and others. Uh, you saw Andy had taught when I was, when I was gone. And we're going to have uh, some of our other council members and Mr. Matthew who are going to be teaching the lessons, getting them not just involved in the uh, administration of the church and all of those other things, but also in those practical service roles. And so they have met with me, and uh, we worked together a Bible study. You, you can probably guess that I produced the introduction when it talks about seven foot, six inch NBA basketball players. I I know that more than Matthew, but. We work together this sheet, but also to put Matthew and some of our council members in an opportunity to teach and preach. So I will be here uh, listening and helping, but I'd like to turn the floor over to Matthew for him to teach and for us to listen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, so here's our premise. Sean Bradley, 7 foot 6 inches, with past dimensions was drafted number two overall in the 1993 NBA draft by the Philadelphia 76ers. He averaged in college 5.2 block shots a game, an NCAA record. He became an all-star his first season and set franchise records his second. From 1996 to 1998, he was statistically a better player than six other Hall of Fame centers. He was great. <laughs> Why did he leave the game he loved early? Uh, he could have made millions and millions of dollars more. Well, the answer in, in our subject today is purity. NBA players are known for extramarital affairs and having children out of wedlock. Many reports list women who frequent hotels and clubs of traveling players looking to get pregnant and get paid thousands in child support. Uh, he was tempted often to cheat on his wife as his teammates often did, and team meetings were held in strip clubs. So, our first question, or my first question to you guys, is uh, why is it difficult for Sean Bradley, a devout Mormon, to remain faithful to his wife in the NBA? Yes, Ms. B. Well, fidelity certainly wasn't the norm. Uh, absolutely <laughs> not. Apparently not, right? Fidelity wasn't the norm, okay. Why else? Temptation. Temptation? Okay. Well, the women are waiting at the clubs, or the hotels and the clubs. It sounds like he could have his pick of whoever's there. Right, and actively, not, not just waiting there, but actively <laughs> seeking these NBA players out, right? I mean, it, it makes it so easy to fall into that temptation because I, I know how I was in my youth, right? And I know that uh, temptation is, is there and it's, it's strong at times. Okay, anybody else? Well, it doesn't seem like the NBA promotes fidelity if they're holding team meetings in strip clubs. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> All right, so what if, what if an NBA player's wife had allowed them to cheat once a year, right, on their marriage? If Sean Bradley's wife had told him, no, it's, it's okay, right? What do, you, what do you think her rationale is in, in just kind of accepting that this is, this is their reality? Stupidity. How so? That kind of thinking to allow that is not right. Not rational? Not spiritual? No, that's, that, I would agree, most definitely. But uh, what, what do you think her motivation or her, yeah, what is her motive for saying, okay, you know what, you can, you can go ahead and do this? You can hang on. 
just to hang on? Money. Money. Money would be a good one. I, uh, yes, Jim. To, to give justification to allow him to do it and to potentially not do it more than once. Okay, so so there's an element of control there, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, yeah, that makes, yeah, I would agree for sure. An element of control? Yes. Well, adding on to that point, I think she'd rather know he did it once a year than not know he might be doing it every week. Huh? Great. Yeah. All very good rationales. Anybody else? Well, it's the devil she knows. Say that again? It's the devil she knows. What do you mean? Well, it's easier to accept them, accept them, blah, 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 blah. Accept something if you know it's there rather than that rather than going to something unknown. So if the saying is it's the devil you know. It's easier to accept the devil you know than the devil you don't. Going back to that element of control. I well, if I do it this way, if I tell him it's okay, he can do it once as long as I know about it and, and we have this set time or, or however whatever however that arrangement works. I don't know, I don't want to know. But that element of control, right? She knows, she knows what's happening and she feels like she's in control of it. When the reality is, if your husband's cheating on you, you're not in control of your marriage. Well, she says when she's aware and she lets him do it, it's not cheating. I mean, that's what, that's what she says here. Yeah, well, but, I mean, that's that's sad, but it, it I mean, it is cheating according to God's word, especially, like, that's, that's a no-no. So, um, you got one over here. Oh, one more. Where? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Our wife loves a husband cheat or continues to love a husband cheat. Then she's encouraging him and being a part of it. Not because she's going out and cheating, but because she knows that he is. And rather than being the one together, they're no longer the one together. So she's also sitting together what God has given her. Sure, and we'll, we'll definitely get into that more, but I, 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 would, I would agree too, right? She is almost, or is condoning that behavior, right? And so we have the moment of, well, okay, he's, if, if, if I let him do it and I tell him it's okay, I have some control over the situation, if I tell him no, he's going to do it anyway. Um, so it's better for me to just let him do it, give him my blessing, and then I know I know what the situation, I know what's going on, and it, it only happens in this instance or this instance when I say he can do it, when in reality he's probably running around on her, you know, all the time. Um, let's apply this in a different context, right? Not, not as far as marital faithfulness, but uh, right, like in, in the context of the commandments, uh, like the fifth commandment, or thou shalt not kill, right? God tells me not to kill. I don't, uh, that doesn't incite a, a, a wanted me to go kill somebody, right? There's the, the no's are a little bit different, or the answer's a little bit different. Hmm. All right, let's get some reasons. Why is it difficult to maintain purity in our culture today? Yes, Kylie. Because some people may feel pressure to do it. Pressure to do it? How's that? Like, I know a lot of teenagers <coughs> nowadays feel pressured if they don't have some type of sexual activity in their life. Why? Just because it, everybody else they know does it. Everybody else they know does it. So there is a lot of pressure, right, from society and from the world, right? What does the world teach versus what does God's word say? What does God teach us to do? So pressure, okay. Uh, peer pressure. What are some other reasons that it's difficult to maintain purity? Societal acceptance. Acceptance? Yeah. Okay, care to elaborate on that? Well, society says it's okay. You look, you look at any movie, any TV, even reading material nowadays, it's acceptable. It's acceptable, right? I would agree, absolutely. Other reasons? Well, yes, Ms. Kim. There has to be value in it. it. I mean, so I think as a culture, 
there is no value to sexual purity. I mean, like, you know, the idea that what do you gain by it? Like, again, society thinking values and principles, beliefs have, those have diminished. There is, it's a self-serving culture. Absolutely. Absolutely, and so they, we do, we have a huge difference in values. It almost, it almost seems as if part, this value of marital faithfulness and, and, and being one flesh with one woman, right, for the rest of your life is, is lost to society. At least it seems like that today. I don't, I don't know how it was a generation ago. I, I want, I'd like to think that it was better, uh, you know, 50 years ago. I don't know how true that is, that it was actually better 50 years ago, but I, I would like to think that, right? In my ideal mind, I like to think that things used to be better. But uh, this has been going on, uh, I mean, since the beginning almost. Okay. So a difference in values, okay. from my peers, right? Almost almost kind of hand in hand with that peer pressure, a difference in values, what what God says versus what the world says. Um, temptation. Temptation is absolutely great. We talked about that in the beginning, right? That you know our, our example here, Sean Bradley, is uh, I mean, temptation is glaring in this situation, right? You you can see you can't miss it. You you would have to willingly miss it. Um any other reasons? Yes, Bill. Uh, this day and age, <clears throat> uh, seem, to me it seems like the younger generation, uh, when they're 12, 15 years old, they look like they're 25, huh. with all the makeup and the, the way they dress and the way they, they just carry on, you know, you have no idea really age-wise, and they're also acting the same, but yet they don't have the, uh, the age and the, the responsibility to, uh, of the age to uh, to be wearing those kind of clothes and to be acting the way they're acting. Right. And I, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Okay. I I agree with you 100%. And I think that yeah, I have three daughters and a son. And so that, I mean, it's incumbent upon me, that responsibility. Just what you said is, is very great to me to raise my children in a manner to where they don't, they they can resist that temptation, that peer pressure, that, that societal pressure, right, from their friends. Um, it, how they look, how they act, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, with my teenage daughter, and I hate to put her on the spot, but I, sometimes, you know, she gets a little too big for her britches, just like I did when I was that age. And so I, I do, I understand, and I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> yes, Kylie? I wanted to say something about what he said, kind of like all the temptation when girls that are my age Hold that thought. Yes, Ms. Kim. Yeah, and I think kind of again, let's go back to the value of it. It's in starting out looking at relationships. I think there's a relationship problem in here. We're looking, you know, there's plenty of people just running around just looking for something to ease, like either loneliness inside or they don't know how to form good, valuable, or you know, good good relationships. So it's just something that can be used, and they think that's how they're going to get to where they want to be with someone less lonely. You know, again, girls, they do. They, they learn young. This is how you get someone to want you with your body, not with right. who I am. Um, but boys, too. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I, you can write. Boys and girls both, young teenage boys and girls both belong under that bus, absolutely. And I think that back to my point, it's it's definitely incumbent upon me um, as a parent, right? I you know, the instinct is to say to my daughters, well, just don't get pregnant or be careful, right? Practice this way or that way, where 
the, the reality or the truth in the matter is, no, don't do it at all, right? Stay away from it completely. But if um, their heart's still wanting something, they're going to find a way to ease that pain in their heart. It, again, it, I don't know that, I see it as more of a relationship. You see your parents' relationship, you're being taught relationships. But if you don't know how to engage in a healthy relationship, this is kind of what comes out. I, Absolutely agree, 100%. And the, back to the, the responsibility to me as a parent, right? I have I have a responsibility to set a good example, right? If my son uh, sees me, you know, running around with my wife and doing this, that, or the other, not not behaving the way a good Christian husband should should behave, loving his his wife as Christ loved the church, right? What is my son going to do? Well, there's a very good chance that he'll follow in my footsteps, right? And I. It is absolutely my responsibility to prevent that from happening, to make sure that I, I bring them to church, I raise them in the faith, I teach them these, these godly values. I, I, I agree 100%. This is a, this is a tough subject. I mean, it's, not a, it's definitely not easy to stand up here and teach it. <laughs> yes, sir. Who had their hand up? Oh, yes, Ms. Sharon. Okay. Um, I, I think you're focusing on young people, and that's great. But there are a lot of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds out there that are lonely, that don't know how to have a good relationship, that don't, I think it's in general, um, out there. Absolutely. There's a lot of bad relationships. I agree. Absolutely. And, and I don't mean to harp on young people that much. No, no just, but I think it is. I think it's, it's just society today. Hey. To, to my own fault, right? It's, I have three daughters, so the, the, the young person, That's right? Like, I'm not you. No, 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 I know. And, and I absolutely agree, 100%. And so I think not just as parents, but even as Christians, if we have a friend that feels lonely, right? We can bring them to church. We can invite them to church. We can point them to God's word, right? To show them that, hey, you're not, you're not so lonely. I know you feel that way, but you, you don't have to feel that way, right? Help them to, uh, you know, witness to them, essentially. Yes, ma'am. Your brother wants to talk to you. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I got two points to make. One, one before we get too far from what you just said about the father being examined. One thing that I've always said, one thing that I firmly believe in, is the father's greatest gift to his children is to love the Bible. Oh, absolutely. That's number one. Number two, accessibility. I mean, look at the internet. Yep. I can't go on the internet and Google the word tuna fish without three <laughs> sexual links coming. Oh, out. man. <laughs> I mean, look how accessible it is to them. Right, absolutely. And that's, that, I don't know whether to say that's part of the problem or it contributes to the, the problem that's already there. I think it's it's more of a contributor. Uh, it just, it, it increases the power of that temptation, right? Absolutely. Um. Any other reasons? One last call. Any other reasons why it's difficult to maintain purity in today's society? Did you hear from somebody else? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Abuse. Abuse. Elaborate, please. Child abuse. What uh, sexual child abuse leads to lack of self-esteem. Leads to I need mean, some way to find that peace and that love from. Someone because I didn't get it from my parents. Looking for attention, right? No, I'm not looking for attention. They're not looking for attention. Child abuse doesn't, sexual child abuse doesn't cause you to look for attention. You're not looking for attention. You're looking to find that comfort that you should have felt as a child. Right. Well, it, feeling like an object, right? They, there's, there's about three different ways we could go down that way. It, and, I, and I agree, that's that's a, a sad part of the world we live in. Yes. Absolutely. That's a big part of a lot of people's lives these days. And, you, know, you have 60, 69,000 children waiting for adoption in the United States because they were taken away from their parents. I would say probably 50 or more percent of that due to sexual that I, I don't know the, the numbers, but that may very well be true. And it, 
I, I, the only solution I know to how we as people can make a dent on that is to, to be good witnesses, good stewards of the blessings that God's given us, and to witness gospel to, to people that are unchurched or don't know the gospel, right? And let the Holy Spirit do the work. That's, I mean, that that's the, the tough part about a subject like this, right? Many sad realities of the world we live in come up to the surface, and we have to address them. Yes, sir. Hey, I think... Susan sharing brokenness and, and Kim describing and sharing how where is the voice that teaches chastity as a positive moral value or the voice that says this is what happened to you how can we help you and love you and care for you and I and that used to be in the church and yet we see so many that their voice is not speaking that way anymore their voice is saying that the depravity of our world is okay and so I, I think it's incumbent on us to say here how can we teach all of us these truths because outside of the church society is not preaching chastity and purity and love and fidelity no one else is saying that right and if we do not and we do not speak on it and help those who are hurt there is no there is no check to the tuna fish searches of the internet <laughs> and that uh, I, I, John's absolutely right it's, it's too easy to find and that ruins things. It, absolutely, I agree. Much more eloquent than I could have put it. Um, all right, let's get into some scripture. First Corinthians six eighteen. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So why does God tell us to flee sexual immorality? Why does God teach us to flee, or tell us to flee sexual immorality? Notice the word flee, right? And I think when I when I hear the word flee, I think of running from a burning building, right? Or running away from something that's trying to harm you. Yes, Mr. Kim. You see it in the scripture. Where? In the first sentence. In the first sentence. It's immoral. It's immoral. It is, it is immoral. Absolutely. Plain and simple. Could it be that <clears throat> this is not not just that it's immoral, but it's also for our own good? Self damaging. You're Self damaging yourself. Absolutely. How how might one damage themselves from being sexually immoral? You get sick. You get sick? Yeah. Right? Not, not just the, the threat of physical sickness, but also emotional and spiritual sickness as well. Absolutely. Why else? We got, yes, sir. Mr. Jim. If Christ and slash the Holy Spirit is within us, we're sinning against Christ himself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I like how you said earlier, some people view themselves just as an object, so they might not care what happens to their body, and something bad really might happen to them. Great. Absolutely. And it goes back to what Pastor was saying, to, that, to our responsibility as, as Christians, as, as stewards of, of God's church. Yeah. God yes, will bless you. Huh? God won't bless your life if you're sexually immoral. You won't bless your life. As as harsh as that is, and as sad a reality as that is, there, there may be some truth to that, right? If you are, you know, if you constantly reject the Holy Spirit, reject God, reject Christ, right? God will eventually leave you out on your own. And then you have you don't have any help, right? You are totally off in a very mean, terrifying, cruel world all by yourself. So that's a very good point, Dad. Absolutely. How can sexual sins, infidelity, pornography, lust have consequences unlike any other sin? Yes, ma'am. I was a Well, it, you 
you know, I don't, far be it for me to know it is anybody else's heart, but hey, like I was, back to what I was saying about if you consistently and terminally reject God, He will leave you off to your lonesome, and it's, it's not a, it's not a nice to, a nice place to be all alone, right? You don't want to be out caught in this world. I, I don't want to be out in this world without Christ, right? Without the Holy Spirit. Absolutely not. Um, why else? Yes, sir, Mr. Steve. So here's one that um, comes to mind, especially, um, I think Sharon brought this up a little bit earlier. Another consequence of sexual immorality is uh, the little souvenir that you might take home. <laughs> Number one most common reportable disease in the United States, more popular than anything else, is chlamydia. Chlamydia. Yeah, number two, we got to react. Okay, so at the very top of the list, and this is true in all westernized nations, sexually transmitted diseases are huge. Right. Okay? And then we learn about 50, 60, 70 year olds. Interesting little piece of trivia. Um, I keep up with CDC reports just from part of my job. Sure. And uh, I read about outbreaks, TB is big in prison, different things here and there. And lo and behold, we had a little hot spot for sexually transmitted diseases down in Florida in the villages. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Retirees yes. who were um, apparently not part of this Bible class and uh, <laughs> had these extra little consequences to their Escapades. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's another consequence that people are certainly not thinking about when they're engaging in illicit behavior with someone. Right, absolutely. Yeah. It, and that's the, that's the point, is that sexual immorality hurts us, right? It's not, not just in a, uh, probably more importantly in a spiritual and emotional way, but also in a physical way, right? And that's, we'll, we'll talk more about that in scriptures of 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And so, you know, God says that, uh, right, it's not good for man to be alone, and, and, and a woman will leave her parents and, and join a man, and the two will become one flesh. So if I'm, if I'm sexually immoral... Uh, you know, I'm not just hurting myself anymore. Now there's somebody else involved, right? Um, and so my partner also has to has to reap the consequences of my actions, so to speak. So a very good point. And back to your point about Florida, I grew up in South Florida, and in the '90s, you know, there was the big AIDS craze, and in like the late '80s, early '90s, and then it kind of died down. But when I went back to visit in 2013. If you hop on the on the metro rail, the, the train or, or a bus, there's advertisements everywhere to have free AIDS tests, free AIDS tests. And so it's just I mean that and that's that's one consequence of, of sexual immorality too. Um it I just I thought that was staggering. It was you know, reality was staggering when, when you read these advertisements and you're like, wow, it's that much of a problem. Well, I think with the age, I'm also a nurse, and I've been a nurse since God was a child. Um, I think with the AIDS crisis is it came to the forefront in the, in the late 70s. Right. I, I remember when we first started hearing about AIDS and HIV. And then in the 80s and 90s, the treatment became much more successful, and people were more aware of it. Right. But now, because people who are HIV positive are living with it, for years, I mean, there's people who've had it for 30 years, and it's never developed into full-blown AIDS. Right. So I think the awareness for the younger generations, um, listen to me, younger generations, I sound like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, the awareness isn't there anymore because people with HIV are living very full and very long lives. Right. So I think the pendulum has swung back to where we were in the early 70s, or late 70s. Does that make it any less of a threat? No, it doesn't, but I think because of the awareness isn't there. Right. Um, and I myself was, was this way, but 
you think you're invincible when you're younger. <laughs> you don't Absolutely. think what you do when you're younger is going to have any lasting consequences. Right. But you get older and you realize, I'm surprised, and I don't know how much my parents know, so I don't want to say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised. Some of the choices I made, I survived. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Do for all. All right, more scripture. Um, well, no, before I go on, any, yes, sir, Jim. Jumped in my mind thinking about the NBA. I remember back when um, uh, Magic Johnson of the yep. Los Angeles Lakers. Um, was diagnosed with AIDS. It was it was almost celebrated that he had an extramarital affair and, and contracted this disease, and um, now he's a spokesperson charging for it. And, uh, again, it was almost celebrated that he that this happened. But and that speaks back to the point, right? What does the world teach, or what does the world say? What does society say versus what does God say? What what does society and the world teach and believe versus what do we as Christians? Right, believe. Yeah. Right? What, what, what are? It's a. There's a huge difference in values. But. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Again. I think when, it, when you got to that question up there, where when we talked about list the reasons why it's difficult to maintain purity in the culture today, and then down here where we are today, I think the word would be safe. <laughs> and, sure. Uh, my mother favorite saying was, Satan is alive and well. And like the pastor said long ago, all you got to do is open the door, right? he comes in, and that's it, he bar the door. And I think he has come into the churches for the acceptance that he's talking about, to allow everything's okay, if it feels good, do it, and uh, he'll uh, deal with it later. That's the deal. Yeah. It, it's that, at least to me, in my experience, was a was a terrifying realization. Is we we look at these behaviors and we don't think much of them, and then you realize where who's motivating that behavior, who's who's right promulgating that behavior, who's pushing that agenda, and it's 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 very sobering, absolutely. I mean, so I, I agree with you 100. Yes, John. Okay, along with uh, Steve there. From Arizona, they had Sun City, which is a retirement community, and very big in there for sexual transmitted disease. And you're talking about acceptance now. You've got the commercials out for, I'm on the pill for right. HIV. Right. You know, yeah. out for prevent it. So that's how it's out of the closet, but it's, it's the last, what, why, why do they need this? Absolutely. Um, it's yes, Miss Kim. I think I saw Miss Hope. No, I was just trying. To, I was just gonna. Um, I just thought of this when Kim was talking about Satan walking in the door, and I totally agree. But I, I think we have to take responsibility for our human hearts because he has no way in the door. He won't come in the door. He can't tempt us with this unless we're already prone to fall for this sin. And again, this as rampant as it is among generations it's just a people i mean history i mean we we just know this is it's, it's a problem i think the verses even speak to i can't even say that i fully even understand why a sexual sin is different from all other sins but god's telling me it is like there's something very specific about sexual sin that causes harm in a way that no other sin will do yeah and in my human heart, again, whatever I'm searching for or looking for, I'm going to be tempted by it if that, I mean, I, I don't, so. And so I don't know the answer either, right, Pastor May? I don't know if you might enlighten us a little bit. <coughs> well, I think, you know, we've had a number of different comments recognizing the fallout of sexual sin, whether that's in the villages or wherever. And I think, I think the honest look in my human heart is to say, I don't want to flee. It's really not going to hurt me, and I can still be fine down the road. Yeah. 
and whether I'm engaging with the temple prostitute in 1 Corinthians, or whether I am engaging with my cell phone, or whether I'm engaging with the concept of I'm 50 and it's okay because no kids are going to come from this relationship, the temptation not to flee comes from this <laughs> inside of me. Yeah, the, the devil helps when I get to the door, but I think the challenge is we, those first four words, flee from sexual morality, flee from pornaya, that the difficulty of us saying, I really don't want to flee, I just don't want to get hurt. That's a, good, that's a really excellent point, right? And that's it. it's kind of why I emphasize the word flee, right? Because it's that's a strong word. It's, it's a very simple word, and it doesn't sound like much, but if you look at the meaning, right? When you flee, when, I, you're right, I don't want to flee, but God tells me to flee, like, and I'm imagining as if it was somebody after me trying to murder me or from a burning building or something like that right it's uh, the Olymp this is olympic speed i mean this is an, speaking to people who understood the olympics at the time this is olympic speed run with the speed of an olympian away from temptation uh, and, so, I, and that is culturally something that if we're not teaching god loves you he does not want you to be in pain flee with the speed of an olympian away from temptation that there, there is something to ruminate on for a half hour. I don't, I don't know near as much Greek, right? So a burning building would, but you know, that, that makes a lot more sense. How about yeah, John Bolt? Bolt. What's that? Bolt. Bolt. You saying Bolt? Yeah, you saying Bolt away. That's right. <laughs> what society is, it, you know, especially towards us Christians, let me think of how to put this, um, you know, they call us spoil sports, tell us we're no fun, um, tell us we're too strict, uh, even, you know, my, my children's friends have, have come down on them hard because there are certain things that we won't let our kids do, and it's to protect them, right? And our, you know, they, they, they catch it from their friends, absolutely. And then we talk to them about it. We're like, look, you know, we understand. We want you to, to do this, and, and we want you to have fun. We want you to have friends. But we don't want to put you in a position to where you can be in danger, right? And I think, my, my feeling is that this is part of the reason that God tells us to flee from sexual immorality, too, right? It's not just because it's immoral, but it's for our own good. Absolutely. All right, more scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Oh, yeah, no, I read that already, didn't I? Okay. All right. Sean Bradley had to leave the NBA because of sexual immorality present every day. Only by removing himself could he remain faithful to God. And so, has anybody ever had a trash can? that was filled up with, oh, I don't know, maybe fruit peelings, leftovers, old fruit, let it let it sit too long, just, oh, I'll, I'll change it later, right? And just let it sit there for a day or two. What happens after you do that? Do the trash can's full and you let it sit there for a day or two? Yes, sir. <laughs> Very good, right. Fly, right, flies start coming and, and, and it starts to stink, absolutely. Uh, what? I'm going to take it out you are, you are, you are a good, helpful son. Absolutely. So, so in, in the analogy of, uh, I, and I don't call any of us trash cans, but we are receptacles, right? We can soak things up, we can carry things, and we can contain things. 
So if you look at the problem here, she's we who's the trash can in this situation? Well, we are. And if we fill up with old rotting food, what's going to happen, right? Or, or we fill up with uh, things that uh, don't smell or look so nice, right? What you know? What's going to happen to us if I carry that around? If I carry around hate and vengeance and sexual immorality in my heart, with how am I going to act as a person? What's what, what outward signs are you going to see of that, right? Everybody with me? So the, the saying in my house is always garbage in, garbage out. And, and the thought behind that is if you put garbage in, right, garbage is going to come out of here. And, and it's going to be not just out of your mouth, but in every part of your being. What you do, where you go, the, the way you talk to people is going to reflect what's in here. And so just like a trash can, if we don't want to stink and we don't want to have flies surrounding us, we got to change the trash. We have to take it out and, and keep that receptacle, that, that can, right? That, that container clean. How does media have an impact on our purity? Maybe going back to not just social media, but uh, the news, TV shows. Yes, ma'am. Um, media like that, but kind of in churches or like in school even, they like show you PowerPoints and like HIVs and stuff like that, and they tell us not to do stuff like that. And so like I feel like a lot of people, like when you're told not to do something, especially as a teenager or something, you're going to want to do it more. And I feel like that goes back to temptation for it too. It, it does go back to temptation. And it, it, we talked about that in the beginning, how, you know, it with it's it's the the no and the want to to get into that temptation is much greater with sexual immorality, right? I'm told that I can't kill people, but yet I don't. Just being told that I can't kill people doesn't incite me a desire to go and commit murder, right? But if you tell me no, I can't have this person or that person or I can't do this or do that, uh, and it's something that you know I feel that I'm supposed to be able to do, right? Just because you told me no, I'm gonna want to do it all the more. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. I got a perfect example. When I was 14, I was reading a book, and I don't remember the name of the book, but my parents said that it's not an appropriate book for you to read. And I said, okay, put it away, and I thought, well, what do they know? They aren't going to know if I read this book. So I get the book, and I open it up, and then there is a, a, a note in my father's hand that says, weren't you told not to read this book? <laughs> I, I could share some similar stories. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, where is our motivation for purity in an impure world? Where do we find? Yes, Ms. B. From God's Word. From God's Word. It's Excellent. It's about the only place you're going to find it. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think Facebook's got it. So we know God's word. So I can find I can find my motivation to remain pure in an impure world in the Bible. What are some other applications or other places that I may be able to find that motivation? Church. Church. Pastor. Well, I, I just I would I would hope we wouldn't skip over that too quickly. I mean, I, I think in the passage it says, I was bought at a price. Mm -hmm. You know, and to to ruminate on my God tells me to flee because he doesn't want me to hurt because he owns me and bought me from sin, death, and hell. And I, I think I think sometimes we, we can talk in a general way, but to say God has bought me at a price and owns me and loves me and cares for me and wants me in heaven, so he doesn't want me to hurt. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to cut off where we're going. I just want to make sure that we, especially our younger people, hear that. And, and whether I'm lonely at 50 or 80 or 13, I am owned and loved by someone who wants the best for me, even though that boy who I think likes me doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't really want the best for me. God does because he owns me and he bought me. Absolutely. And, and what, what is the price that, that God bought? Well, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And, and, and as the loving father that, that, that God our Almighty is, our father, right? He, he sends his only son to die to pay the penalty that I should well be paying. 
And so it's we were bought at a price, and not just any price, the, the most expensive price, right? Uh, because God's own son had to die on the cross and, and go through how much torture and beatings before that even happened. So it, I, I think that's the, that's an excellent point, is that we were bought at a price, and, and that's something that I... Uh, it coming into my middle age and, and, and realizing maybe some of the wisdom of, of my parents and and other uh, other elders of mine is that I, I kind of I do I have to every day I have to kind of consider that I, I'm not my own person and that I was bought at a price that that Christ died on the cross for me and so if that be the case why would why should why should I do or why should I want to do things that would would not just sin against my own body, but is ultimately a sin against God and a sin against Christ, right? Why do I want to spit in his face when he's done nothing but love me? And even though I've, I've spit in his face and, and kicked and screamed like the ordinary little child, he still brings me back into his loving arms, absolutely. Bought at a price. That's heavy stuff, man. Really heavy. All right, so... So, church, our motivation for in an impu uh, for purity in an impure world, church, the Bible. What about, oh, yes, Ms. Sharon? Surrounding yourself with people that have the same beliefs and, uh, and share the same type of things they are more pure. It's as if you took... Down, there are some fighters someplace. Oh. And I'm hanging out. I mean, <laughs> there's different places. Right? It's, it's as if you took the words right out of my mouth, right? Not only do I want to study God's word, but I want to go to where God's word is preached and taught and to where others take God's word with the seriousness that I like to think that I take to it, right? I want to surround myself and also the wisdom of my elders, right? I think is it, it just, this is me, this is an indictment on myself, is that, um, what's, Jim's daughter, right? Your name, I'm sorry. Brandy. Brandy, I'm sorry. Like Miss Brandy was saying, uh, once upon a time I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof, or at least I thought I was. And then uh, I get a little bit older and realize that my body is a lot less forgiving than it used to be. Um, but luckily God is, is always forgiving. like to buy your child, niece, granddaughter, nephew, some clothes for her birthday, and she has requested a particular style, but this particular style is a bit revealing, but not too much, it's just maybe questionable, it's, it's right there on the borderline, right, and you go ahead and decide to buy this clothing. Well, imagine you're writing this birthday card for your daughter, or your granddaughter, your niece, your nephew, whoever it be. And along with a gift, you're writing this birthday card. What, what are some things we would write in that card, right? Like, how would we, yeah, what would you write about in the card? Well, about the clothing purchase that you made. What would you say to them? Yes, ma'am. I wouldn't buy them. You wouldn't but buy them? If I were to write a card after that, I would say... You, my dad used to say you don't want to cause someone else to sin by the way you present yourself. So, therefore, with your speech, your attitude, your your lack of self-control, and your outward appearance, might cause someone else to sin. How would you feel so good about doing that? You know, so, probably I would put. 14 over 100, and I put a question mark at the weather, that's going to continue. <laughs> uh, and that's, that, that's something that I think, going back to the wisdom of my elders, and many of my elders in this room, is that I have learned the, the importance of not giving offense. Right? Because giving offense is, if I do something and you're offended by it, I've just sent whether I, my intention was to, whether I was doing it intentionally or not. 
Um, what else? What else could we write in this birthday card along with this clothing purchase? Let's pretend you did buy it. You did buy it, right? And and you did so against your better judgment, right? So you're gonna give this to your niece, your nephew, your daughter, whoever. But you're gonna, you know, you're gonna tell them how you feel about it. What are we gonna say to them? Yes. That I bought it, but I really don't agree with it. Don't agree with it. Okay. Yes, Willie. I bought it because you don't deserve it. <laughs> well, if I only got what I deserved, right? Yeah. <laughs> also, I hang it in the closet as a reminder of what not to wear. Hey, that's, that's an idea. I don't know if that would work, but it's possible. <laughs> Mr. John. I got a great deal on this. Five times too big for you. It's got a hole in it, but I got a great deal. <laughs> you say to your daughter, granddaughter, niece, nephew, son, if they were wearing something or wanted something that was a bit revealing or, or questionably inappropriate? I'd ask them why they wanted it. You'd ask them why, why that's they don't think it happened. Right. And I think that's important. And I think that would be that would be the question to ask is why why do you want to do this? And what, what are some possible answers? Right? So imagine a teenage girl in middle school. <laughs> but why? Right? Getting to the root of the issue, and we've known from previous Bible studies, uh, just in, in disciplining children, is you don't you don't want to dance around or beat around the bush. You want to get to the heart of the issue. And so asking why they want to wear this or why they feel they need to wear this. Uh, would be a very good question to ask, and, and my guess is the answer would probably be one of these things on this list. If but not all. If not all, well, yeah, it's probably a mixture of all of those things, right? There's a difference in values between mm, the way I'm trying to raise my children versus the way so-and-so is trying to raise their children, and their children is allowed to wear revealing clothing or play play graphic video games, watch graphic TV and movies, right? Whereas I don't I don't allow my kids to do that for their own good to protect them. This is the same way God, my Heavenly Father, is trying to protect me by telling me I should flee from this in His Word. Um, absolutely, a temptation is there. I want to fit in. I want to be like everybody else. Uh, this is what all the cool kids are doing. I, you know, I was very guilty of that in my teenage years and, and on into my 20s even. Loneliness, back to I want to fit in. If, if I wear this, people will accept me. They will think I'm cool, right? I don't have to be so lonely. If I just have this amount of money or wear this style of clothing or engage in this behavior with everybody else, they will, you know, they'll treat me better because that's what they're doing and that's what they like to do. And, and the list could go on at infinitum, I think. We could, we could probably add 20 or 30 more to that list. See any hands? Back. My daughter did not want to wear any of those signage clothes back in the day, because she's 37 now. But, but even in grade school, she was harassed mm -hmm. for her clothes. OK. They were her twice. Right. And she didn't want her navel showing, she didn't want really short shorts, she didn't want any of that. And we were talking about this, right? And, which was fine with me. But then the girls started calling the house, mm -hmm. asking her, and I'd have to be home one day from work. I got on that phone and I gave them crap. And don't you ever call here again when I changed my phone. And she was never bothered again. Thank you for sharing that. That's... I mean, I just, you know. And that was before the real bullying stage came. Right. Yeah. So it's it is it's a tough world, and I. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Agree or disagree? When dating, I should see how far I can go in my physical relationship with my boyfriend and girlfriend. As long as we stop short of sex, that's okay. Kylie. I very much so disagree. Okay, hold that thought. 
Who else? Dis agree or disagree? We can do whatever we want so long as we stop short of sex. Disagree. Disagree? Where at? Oh, B. Okay. Oh, both of us. Or B and Bill. All right. Disagree. Yeah. Why? Why? Once you start a sin, it's very hard to stop. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I hear somebody I haven't heard from yet. Agree, disagree. We can do whatever we want so long as we don't have sex. Miss Rhonda, you made on. Oh, yeah. I see you shaking your head. You made on eye contact. That's. Oh, no, I don't. I have to go by his rules. <laughs> <laughs> let's hear let's hear from the young one. Why do you disagree, Kylie? Kind of like how many of you would say there are many things that we attach to the bad part and if once you start something it's kind of hard to stop it and you're just gonna walk more and more until you probably get beaten. Very good. I my, my, my children make them proud. <laughs> it, it, I, I think she does. Anybody else want to agree or disagree? We all disagree? Why? Yes, Luke. Well, sexual immorality is a lot more than just having sex. It's the lust. It's the desire. I mean, Absolutely. You can't just say it's sex. Absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, Matthew chapter 5 27, 28, Jesus says that if you even look at another person with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery, right? And so I think that speaks to the point greatly is that it, it is more than just sex. It's everything that leads up to it. Yes, ma'am. William brought up a good point. He said that like smoking or any other vice that we have, sex can become addictive. It can Absolutely. become a... Um, Project so that you conquer, you know, it feeds your ego. It, yeah, I, I would agree for sure. It can definitely, it, I could, it's easy for me in, in my pride to get very puffed up and swollen and, and just, I, I can maybe, uh, I can imagine I'm, I'm walking the shoes of the, of the NBA player who's, you know, play, plays on a pro basketball team, has millions of dollars, right, and has, has, pretty girls actively seeking seeking them out, right? And we can all fall into that, that same trap. True or false? Mr. Matthew? Oh, yes, sir. It might be time to close the prayer. Oh, is it? Sorry to cut you off. That's OK. I can close. That would be great. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the teaching of your word today and the opportunity to hear from fellow brothers and sisters the encouragement that we need at any age to attain purity, to maintain purity, foreign confession to admit my sin and wish to strive better tomorrow. You are a God who loves me, that's why you bought me, and a God who wants the best for me. Help me in my conversations and in my life and in the things that I look at to remember the price that you bought me and how much you love me and help me to flee. Give, give speed to my feet to flee from those temptations present and to flee to the cross for forgiveness and love. In your son's name we pray. Thank you.